Okay, I'll slowly start. Um, welcome, Ashra Akhan. So happy to have you at our lecture series at Penn. Uh, Ashra will be introduced tonight by Daniel Barber, and we will have uh, a lively discussion afterwards. So stay tuned. Great, thank you. Thank you, Linka. Welcome, welcome to Ezra. Um, yes, my name is Daniel Barber. I'm the chair of the PhD program in architecture at Penn, for those of you who don't know me. Very happy to have the chance to introduce our guest uh, this evening, uh, to, and of course, to hear the lecture as well. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, Ezra was supposed to join us in March or April, but you know we all know what happened. Um, so we're really glad that she was able to, um, we were all able to find a, a good moment to, to come back together and, and have this opportunity to hear about her recent research. Ezra is the Michael A. McCarthy Professor of Architectural Theory and the director of the Inaudi Center for International Studies at Corn Cornell University. Her research explores intersections and translations between European and West Asian architectural cultures with a keen eye towards how architecture, which is the sort of configuration of space and its representation, has long been a site for the negotiation of social and environmental justice. And, and this is where really Ezra has helped to not only make her own contributions to the field in my mind around these questions of histories of justice and translations and negotiations, um, not only make her own sort of mark through her research, but also really cultivate and engage with the research of others to, to help to, to clarify and open up some of those discussions. Um, Ezra has published a number of books and edited volumes, including Architecture in Translation, uh, Germany, Turkey, and the Modern House, and Open Architecture, Migration, Citizenship, and the Urban Renewal of Berlin Kreuzberg by IBA 1984-87, which I don't think it was intended as such, but it's a great sort of, I don't want to say tour guide, because that sounds so somehow demeaning, but it's a great book to read while you're there and can kind of walk around and see the buildings and get a sense of the spaces she's discussing. It's a really nice uh, companion. Um, and a fa fascinating study of the immigrant experience in Berlin's uh, sort of Cold War regeneration, one of, one of them. Ezra's careful research and writing produces a world where justice is at stake and her work has uh, helped to reconsider both the subject and the object of the field, fo focusing us in on the experience of, of immigration and translation and migration as much as the spaces and habitats that these phenomena are entwined with. Uh, Ezra has also recently entered into discussions of the pandemic city, uh, a number of interviews and, and other sorts of discussions the last few months that have helped illuminate some of the histories and urban mechanisms of viral management. Uh, so she is in this case, in a sense, right, in all of these senses, really one of our kind of bravest architectural historians, I think, willing to enter the fray and, and not hold back. Uh, uh, engaged in, in these dynamic discussions and, and you know, aware that sort of um, the vitality of the material she brings to the table. So her energy and dynamism has been appreciated and celebrated in how it's uh, been impacting the culture of the field. So we're really lucky to have Ezra here tonight. It's, it's a really great moment to uh, get a chance to open up some of the boxes that, uh, uh, that she'll help us to look through. Uh, I think we'll be seeing a preview of what I understand to be her next book. Um, the Right to Heal, Architecture in Post-Conflict and Post-Disaster Societies. Uh, so again, really looking forward. Just a quick note before I turn it over to her uh, of how we're gonna play this out. Ezra will give her talk in just a moment. Um, I'll sort of pop back in at the end and we'll open up a, a brief panel discussion with a number of our uh, history theory faculty here in the Department of Architecture, whom I'll pre briefly introduce when their faces are kind of part of the rectangles up here in a, in a little bit. Um, so we'll start a sort of panel discussion with them and then open it out to the audience. Um, so please be submitting questions into the chat um, or the Q&A function, sorry, um, and we'll get to them, uh, get to as many as we can. So please join me in welcoming uh, Ezra Axan to uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes, good. Yes. Okay. Um, I would like to thank uh, Rinka, uh, Danielle, Ivy and Scott for inviting me and for the very smooth organization of this lecture, twice actually, one in person and the other online. And also thank you Carson, Juliana, Evangelos and Alexandra for agreeing to host the post-lecture discussion and I'm looking forward to it. 
So this lecture is a work in progress of a chapter from my book, Right to Heal, which was originally scheduled for last spring, but postponed due to the coronavirus pandemic. As I'm sure you agree, a lot happened since then, and I found myself sharing parts of this work in progress in an unusually large number of op-eds and interviews and organizing webinars on the current crisis that were exposed with the public health emergency. During this time, I can beckon back again to the premise that started this research. To insist on imagining the future may be the most meaningful resistance against the destructive powers in times of crisis. In the context of ongoing and recent conflicts and human-made disasters, such as the disproportionate impact of public health crisis, police violence, fires, deadly floods, explosions, and extinctions, Many societies are remind, reminded of the pressing need for conceptual frameworks and practices that open possibilities for healing. How reversible is damage due to internal and social conflicts? How does a post-disaster society accomplish justice through architecture? If buildings have historically been the media through which ruling powers erect their monuments and inscribe their control, at the expense of natural and social fabrics, can they also become platforms where societies move toward healing? The research I'm proposing explores architecture's role in transitional justice and in healing societies after intense upheavals and internal conflicts due to state violence, colonization, ethnocentrism, environmental degradation, and economic meltdown. The concept of transitional justice entered the lexicon of international law as accountability for past abuses came to the forefront of grassroots human rights movements and as the new nations emerged out of the end of Cold War. Today, the term refers to the full range of processes and mechanisms associated with a society's attempts to come to terms with the legacy of large scale past abuses in order to ensure accountability serve justice and achieve reconciliation, to use Kofi Annan's definition. Today, transitions from civil wars, genocides, apartheid, coup d'etats, as well as reparations to heal from colonization and slavery may become topics of the multidisciplinary field of transitional justice. So in my own research, I intend to expose critically not only architecture's complicit and opportunistic role in conflicts, but also to demonstrate its creative potential toward a more meaningful reconstitution. Rather than a tall order for post-traumatic societies, the term right to heal is meant to criticize architectural practices that perpetuate crisis and to contrast them to examples that envision social, global, and environmental justice. So one of my intentions is to show the interconnected histories of colonization, racism, xenophobia, and environmental extraction. Chapters build on each other to show how present scars have deep roots in history and can be traced to connected events throughout the past century as colonizing empires dissolved into purest nation states. So it is possible, I think, to show that a mother's right to mourn is also a society's right to heal from state violence. A city's struggle to recover from deadly explosions and collapses is the same struggle to avoid economic crashes. A country's right to feed its population is also its right to heal from colonization and environmental extraction. Another country's right to heal from global war is also the world's right to recover from global warming. And the planet Earth's species right to live is also the nation's struggle to live together. So today I have chosen a historical case that shows that a displaced village community's right to heal also exposes the deep wounds of xenophobia and international law viciousness. I believe in the power of storytelling to make arguments. So I hope the history I'm about to tell you will touch you as much as it touched me while researching it, even though it's time, place and characters may deceptively seem distant. And at this point, I would like to uh, share my screen. Okay, so are you seeing uh, my um, cover page? Okay, great. Yes. 
So um, to the list of world changing events that took place this year, another one was added on July 24, when the 15th, 15th century old Hagia Sophia, originally built as a church and converted into a mosque in 1453 and a museum in 1934, was reconverted into a mosque. While the Hagia Sophia has raised global attention, the Muslim Christian partition between Europe and the Middle East had far more consequences on architecture than acknowledged. When the architect Aslu Özbay's team discovered a sunken communal space under the piles of debris during the retrofitting of a group of Cappadocian buildings in the early 2000s, they came face to face with the long history of dispossessions during the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire into different nation states at the dawn of the 20th century. The village was deserted and many of the houses were either totally destroyed or barely standing. The team kept removing the debris for two years until they found what must have been an ancient Byzantine church used with minor changes as a caravanserai and a candle oil workshop during the Seljuk and Ottoman times. Cappadocia is a very special place with its natural geography formed in a geological process of volcanic eruptions and erosions that started millions of years ago. With its fairy chimneys used as monasteries ornamented with outstanding iconic paintings. And with its built environment composed of rock cut houses and vertical subterranean cities of tough stone caves. How come, you may ask, a Byzantine church and an entire village that was populated until a few decades ago be abandoned in such a striking landscape? This talk focuses on the stories of two rural communities, one departing from, the other arriving at the same village in Cappadocia as a result of an international treaty. By connecting the story of this village to thousands of others that were affected by the same international law, it makes a case for architecture's place in transitional justice. So the international treaty legalizing the displacement of the characters in the story was the exchange of populations that was signed as an annex to the Lausanne Peace Treaty of the League of Nations in 1923. In the aftermath of World War I and as an international recognition of the new nation states that came out of the Ottoman Empire, this treaty mandated the compulsory migration of all Christian Greeks and Muslim Turks to their respective new nation states. It also legitimized the refugee stat status of those who had moved between the lands due to wars. The treaty affected close to 2 million people. Greece's Muslim population decreased from 20 to 6%, Turkey's non-Muslim population from 20 to 2.5%. Some call this a repatriation, others a displacement. The history of this compulsory mass migration has been written separately from the polarized nationalist perspectives of Greece and Turkey. This talk instead exposes a big contrast between the declarations of state agents and the experiences of those involved. The population exchange has been characterized either as a cure to a problem or the cause of countless traumas either as an agreement that brought stability and peace to a region or one that unjustifiably ripped people apart. To this day, some scholars define the international decision as a necessary evil, the most humanitarian of logistically viable options, others as a segregation justified through racialized discourses of incommensurable differences. A canonic photograph taken during the League of Nations meeting in Lausanne stands in stark contrast to other visual documents of the event. A group of men representing the participating countries in ironed official attire look at the camera to declare the new international order. As the entitled looks confirm, the participating diplomats perceive the peace treaty as a resolution to all long overdue problems. Nansen, the chief negotiator won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work to quote, resettle, repatriate, and provide aid to refugees. The exchange subcommittee decided to implement an irreversible and compulsory mass migration rather than employing the existing international laws of minority protection that were in effect in Europe at the time. 
or rather than regulating voluntary transfers and giving individuals the right to self-determination, as it was the case for other borders in Europe. They divided the exchangeable populations into two purified categories, which assumed the alignment of religion, nation, and territory, regardless of the actual diversity of peoples, and whether there were hostile or peaceful relations on the ground. In effect, the statesman thought homogenization was a mandatory principle for the inauguration of nation states that they simultaneously solidified as an international norm of the 20th century. The contradiction must have escaped them that compulsory transfers, such as slave trades, had made much of the world's history, but were supposed to have become violations of international law with modernity. The Lausanne Treaty served as the legal formalization of a modern forced mass displacement of unprecedented magnitude regulated by international law. It also served as a model for others, such as the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947. In the lexicon of United Nations, transitional justice means obliging accountability for human rights violations by mobilizing international law. But this case calls for healing from both state violence and international law viciousness. Surely this was not the first time people voluntarily or involuntarily migrated. As a matter of fact, the Ottoman Empire managed a territory that cut across one of the five major nomadic areas of the world and resettled communities for centuries. The early Ottoman state structure from 11th to 14th centuries integrated the nomadic tribes to help with the movement of goods. Migration was always a policy in settling the newly acquired territories, either as a form of punishment or incentive. The superimposition of long distance migrations onto local movements created a highly fluid social environment where it became difficult to distinguish between the arriving, staying and departing populations or sedentary households. Against this background of centuries-long migrations and hybridizations, Lord Curzon, who coordinated the Lausanne Conference, defined the 1923 exchange as the unmixing of peoples. A British imperialist in India, he was no stranger to dividing peoples based on his perceived ideas about religion and race, as he had already partitioned Bengal. The Lausanne Treaty mandated the migration to end all migrations. Architecture holds a probing place in this population transfer. For instance, Lord Curzon was specifically invested in Hagia Sophia. In his report, The Future of Constantinople of 1919, he suggested to convert Hagia Sophia from a mosque into a church, following the Santa Sophia Redemption Committee. Against the will of such organizations, Hagia Sophia was not converted into a church, but the Lausanne Treaty introduced irreversible consequences on architecture. Basically, by making a clear distinction between the movables and the immovables. Immigrants were free to carry or transport their movable property, but immovable property had to be liquidated. The rest of the treaty regulated how such a liquidification were to be made, which was prone to countless messy transactions and eventually made migrants much poorer. No wonder the entire enterprise was called an exchange, and no wonder Nansen considered the negotiations as a technical problem about the economic aspect, calling all else folkish romanticism. Architecture had to be commodified so that its exchange value could be transported uh, as a prerequisite of nation building. After the transportation of the enforced migrants, the governments of Greece and Turkey went back and forth about their remaining properties and cultural heritage, eventually signing the Treaties of Friendship in 1930. Hagia Sophia's becoming a museum a decade after the Lausanne Treaty may be interpreted as a brief moment of international friendship. It was in the context and spirit of this agreement that the Christian symbols in Hagia Sophia, which had been covered with plaster over time, started being revealed in 1931. The building was turned into a museum in 34 as a place for credible international research and education of both Byzantine and Ottoman heritage. However, Hagia Sophia as a museum was an exception because countless mosques and churches, houses and community buildings all over the lands across both sides of the agency 
remained neglected and left to decay after the population exchange. The experiences of those who were subject to this forced migration significantly differed from the declarations of the diplomats, as well as the celebratory histories of the polarized nation states. It would be useful to know that individual testimonies of enforced migrants reached the public only in the 2000s. The Center for Asia Min Minor Studies in Athens had identified over 2,000 settlements and interviewed 5,000 migrants under the directorship of Madpol Merlier. However, the center's activity had been perceived as a biased, unscientific collection, called a bourgeois interest in oral folk, and an amateur pastime of an education, educated lady of leisure, end of quote. In Turkey, the individual testimonies of migrants started being collected in 2000s and were initially published as works of literature rather than oral history. So in this lecture, I will be using these migrant testimonies and archival photographs as evidences of a counter narrative to the official accounts of international law and national historiography. The protagonists of our story, Serapin Rizos and Süreyya Aytaş, departed from and arrived in the same Cappadocian village, respectively. Many communities did not fit into the treaty's purified categories, including Albanians in Greece, Turkish-speaking Orthodox Christians of Cappadocia, Macedonian-speaking Muslims of Saloniki, Christian Orthodox Arabs, Christians who followed the Patriarch in Damascus or Kayseri, and so on. Many deported communities categorized as Greek spoke Turkish and vice versa. Some said they had never heard the names of the countries that they were supposed to become a citizen of. Rizos and Aytash also fell into the treaty's indeterminate categories. For instance, Serapin Rizos' community resided in Sinasos, whose Turkish name is Mustafa Pasha, and all places have two names. I hope it won't be too confusing. So Rizos' community were Turkish-speaking Christians who wrote in Greek alphabet. Ironically, soon after they left Sinasos, Aytash's village was brought in from Germany, even though they did not know a word of Turkish, but spoke a special Macedonian dialect. In her grandfather's recollection, they found themselves dropped in the village square after a two months long journey. The locals who saw their miserable condition brought some food, but when they thanked in their own language, the locals started screaming, these are foreigners, these are infidels. Rizos and Aytash's families had different experiences before departing their hometowns. Rizos testified to mutually supportive and friendly relations in Sinasos. Migrants from Aytash's hometown spoke of their happy existence that deteriorated with the Balkan Wars. Similarly, the oral histories both in Greece and Turkey revealed mixed reminiscences of multi-ethnic life before the Lausanne Treaty. Those who participated in the wars or civilians who lived in the conflict areas narrated killings and beatings, destructions and lootings, while others testified to peaceful and supportive relations. Many blamed an anonymous group of bandits rather than their neighbors. The testimonies of ex cappadocians overwhelmingly spoke of a friendly coexistence rather than a brutal civil war. Quote, when we learned about the exchange, we were very surprised. Could an entire village be sent to Greece? Or Sofia Devletoglu spoke of a Mr. Suleiman who unlocked the door to let her take her valuables under state custody and replace them with junk so that she did not lose her wealth. Such stories remind us of the importance of mid-level bureaucrats who showed some resistance rather than absolute obedience to state's orders and who could avoid the banality of evil to evoke Hannah Arendt's explanation of the spread of fascism. The last slide. So just before his forced migration in 1924, Rizos decided to make a photo album of the buildings that were defined as immovables in the exchange treaty. Cappadocia is a very special place, and who can blame Rizos for wanting to capture the images of his hometown one last time? Not owning a camera himself, he asked the wealthier Pantazidis sons from the neighboring village, Urgut, for help, and they photographed the surrounding villages. As he was speaking of the dwellings and chapels carved into geological formations, Rizos wrote, they were veritable fortresses cut in enormous sandstone rocks. 
you went into a large rock cut cavern. At the far end, you made out other doorways. High up on the ceiling, you saw another hall, which communicated with another chain of hideouts. Rizos narrated his own house as follows. The greater part of my family house was hewn from an enormous rock. The rock was 50 meters high. Then he went on telling every single detail. I will show images from the photo album as I'm speaking. Acknowledging the delicate craftsmanship, he continued. The hewing of the bathroom is so fine and beautiful that it immediately draws your attention and you realize that it's a work of an artisan devoted to his job. You think it's a work of art that it has been carved. The Sinasos photo album as the last site before deportation is unique in the visual catalog of exchange. However, there are ample descriptions of migrants' final looks. Those who traveled backwards in the car in order to see the last tip of the minaret disappear. Those who put the luggage on the ground to have a good look and waved goodbye with their hats. Or those who watched the land from the ship until it became the flat horizon. Nikodopoulos was the last Greek to leave Sinassos. On October 2, he sent a telegram to Istanbul. Today, the last of us who remained in Sinassos are also leaving. Sinassos, my dearest homeland, I address you my last goodbye. The photographs is in Rizos' album stood in stark contrast to the disciplinary photographs of the state institutions that were established to oversee the massive management challenge of the dislocation, transportation, temporary accommodation, and relocation of hundreds and thousands of people with their belongings and animals. The migration officers made systematic collections of photographs and produced IDs using the camera to register, regulate, and control human bodies. Military and commercial ships carried the migrants between Greece and Turkey. Photographs taken in port cities and ships that show masses of bodies being regulated between lands are in sharp contrast to the ones that came out of the slick spaces in Lausanne, but they do not necessarily serve a different purpose. They imply the magnitude of the event and its technical difficulty, but do not necessarily portray the deaths or the loss of property. They must have been intended to present the exchange as a solution to a problem, a necessity, a repatriation, carrying masses to their new healing homes after conflict and a tough journey. But photographs always have the power to subvert their captions and the intentions of their commissioners. When the camera zooms into the faces among the masses of bodies, the resulting photographs show trauma and anger rather than enthusiasm for a peaceful and stable life with fellow nationals. They indeed put a human face to international law and nation formation. Years later, migrant testimonies filled in the gaps in these photographs and official written accounts. In addition to the last site before deportation, the transportation made an inerasable mark in practically every migrant's memory. For instance, Rizzo's neighbors of Prokopi walked on foot to Ulukrishla, took the train to Mersin and the ship to Praesis in a journey that lasted for a month. After staying in quarantine for days, they lived in tents between 1925 and 27, when 60 of them died out of malaria. Aytash's family left Jarveni for Seleniki and spent 35 days on the sea in two ships while being transported to Mersin, from where they were taken first to Lukishla, then to Nide, then to Urgub, before walking to Mustafa Pasha or Sinasos. They started 500 people but lost 120 to epidemics on the way. Flu, tuberculosis, and malaria were the common epidemics during the exchange killing at least 20% of the migrants, according to the League of Nations. The real numbers must be higher. Almost everyone remembers that the dead bodies were thrown into the sea during transportation. Parents hid their children's death until they could not hide the smell, and one mother jumped into the sea with her deceased baby. The fiction writers have been particularly moved with this image and written stories about migrants who kept looking for lands where the fish did not eat dead babies. So usually there's a two-phase architectural response to disasters that produce a shock effect in communities. First, there's the emergency relief space in the acute phase, 
such as medical treatment and mass quarantine locations or temporary shelters after displacement. Sometimes this space is so long that it confines entire generations to a state of emergency. Second, there's presumably the permanent solution, purporting to turn life back to the new normal, many of which have fallen short of making true reforms. As a result of the arrival of approximately 1.2 million exchange individuals, one in every four people in Greece was an immigrant. Turkey had received immigrants from other lands, uh, so as a result of which an estimated 1.5 million people were homeless. The refugees in Greece camp, uh, camping in emergency relief spaces, including the banks of um, Acropolis, school buildings, public baths, and railway stations. Of all the existing public spaces that were appropriated for the crisis, the Athens Opera House was the most striking, where each family camped in one of the theater boxes. Additionally, makeshift sheds were constructed around Athens, which later became permanent neighborhoods. Period photographs confirm that shelters were initially constructed from fragile materials such as cloth, tents, and tin roofs. They were built with ad hoc street patterns that organize their community relations rather than on grid plans that characterize official camps. Soon after, wooden constructions replaced the huts and tents. Arrival zones around Athens, such as Kaiseriani, was initially built in an informal way as a refugee relief space, but then grew into a large neighborhood with many urban functions, even though it's preserved a settlement pattern. Others, such as New Smyrna, initially we emerged with one to two storey sparsely placed houses, but soon flourished into a wealthy neighborhood. Eventually, 350,000 migrants settled in Athens, almost doubling the city's population. As a result of the separation of town planning and refugee settlement offices due to the urgency of the housing shortage, the city of Athens put existing master plans on hold and allocated areas reserved for green to refugee zones. According to one critic, the result was uncoordinated and unsustainable. The aspirations to produce urban plans were never fulfilled. The modern Greek city was thus turned into a homeowner refugee settlement, which scars the Greek landscape up to the present day." End of quote. So specifically tasked with permanent settlement and the integration of migrants into the production chain, RSC prioritized agricultural settlements. Resource community of Sinasos was among those settled in rural lands. They named the village New Sinasos, just like many towns and urban neighborhoods in today's Greece that are named in reference to the departure place of migrants. In Turkey, arriving migrants were temporarily accommodated in hostels. If one were to assume the successful application of a 17-point hostel regulation, each family had its own private space Everyone slept on beds, nobody on wood, all rooms were heated, lit, secured in healthy conditions, there was running water, sanitary staff, doctor, gendarme, and so on. However, records on the ground painted a much grimmer picture, reporting on migrants being dragged from place to place before getting settled in their permanent places, families being separated and sent to wrong towns, or some giving up their rights out of despair. All over the land, in both countries, immigrants were settled in houses vacated by emigrants. In Aitash's village in Greece, for instance, the two exchange populations overlapped due to the gap between departure and arrival times. In an interstitial time, and as a hybrid solution between temporary and permanent housing, her grandparents shared their houses with Greeks arriving from Turkey. Alia Özbay, for instance, remembered becoming like a foreigner in her own house, and complained that the newcomers cooked her chickens, which were her sources of income. Other testimonies also mentioned the inappropriate matching of home shares. Three migrant families from Turkey were brought into Mustafa Ajar's house, for instance, who were craftspeople, not farmers. Rather than feeding the animals and getting produce, they kept killing and eating the animals. These mismatching stories during temporary housing stage were only a prelude to a much more permanent state apparatus for long-term relocation. In Turkey, the government quickly identified 10 regions and settled communities arbitrarily. Craftsmen were sent to farms, tobacconists were brought uh, to soils 
that were unsuitable for tobacco. Those in need of grape farms and olive orchards were mixed up. Farmers who had arrived with their cows and mules in Kayseri were given urban houses and had to share their apartments with their farm animals. Migrants settled in Greek vineyards, cut the trees as they did not know the fruit was edible, and so on. As a result, some former Greek towns such as Levisi or Kayaköy were completely abandoned and soon became ruins. The existing building stock of abandoned houses was to be distributed to the treaties migrants. However, in a war-torn and post-genocide context, there was no reliable account. Empty Greek and Armenian houses, especially the wealthy ones, were not necessarily distributed to migrants, but seized by government officials and opportunist locals. When Aytash's village got exchanged and arrived in Sinasos upon the departure of Rizos's family, only 100 of the 600 abandoned houses were left for them. Historians who use state records as their sources explain these missettlements as understandable glitches in the institutional chaos of nation building process in a war torn land. This is partially true, and the government must have known that nobody would benefit from the failed economic integration of the migrants. However, it's also important to realize that the new Turkish state was quick to turn land settlement into a tool for demographic engineering. First coined by Milika Bukman in 1997, who explained inter-ethnic conflicts as the demographic struggle for power, the term demographic engineering can be defined as the intentional pursuit by ethnic groups of strategies aimed at increasing their demographic strength, either as an end in itself or as a means to military or political power. Its methods abound, including ethnic cleansing, affecting fertility rates, manipulating push and pull factors of migration, population transfer, deportation, immigrant bans, resettlements, selective tax policies, renaming locations, and so on. I'm sure you recognize some of these in this country. The Exchange of Populations Treaty was an episode in demographic engineering managed by international law, and the states continued devising other mechanisms thereafter. During the Lausanne discussions, it was suggested to agglomerate the migrants in one area, but the delegates rejected the proposals as a threat to security. Instead, both states dispersed them across the land. In 1934, an additional settlement law was instituted in Turkey to manage a second wave of population transfer, which was introduced as one of the greatest devices for assuring the future of the Turkish race, quote unquote. So the, the law uh, divided the country into three zones, where one zone was clearly set aside for the relocation of populations so as to ensure not only the migrants, but also the locals assimilation into Turkish culture. The Kurdish minority zones in East Anatolia were particular targets, and some Balkan migrants were located there. In summary, the state extended the demographic engineering mechanisms that were put in place with an international treaty and turned the expulsion of Greeks from Anatolia into one of the many state apparatuses of Turkification. On the other side of the agency, the exchange treaty amplified rather than put an end to ethnocentrism in Greece as well. As a result of the exchange, the Muslim population in many Greek cities dropped from 70 to 0%. The migration bureaucrats functioned with racial categories that planted seeds of discrimination within the new society. With stereotypical tropes of Western Orientalism that look down on migrants, the RSC president described the arrival of people from Turkey as follows, quote, the streets of Athens were transformed by strange dialectics and outlandish peasant costumes from Asia Minor. Misery is always picturesque. In 1926, League of Nations report categorized the migrants arriving in Greece based on their departure places with striking stereotypes even though it insisted on their racial purity. Quote, Among those brothers by race, there's a complete identity, but having lived in different countries and districts, they differ in character. Those arriving from inner Anatolia, who were living in the midst of Turks and Kurds, had characteristics of Asiatic peoples being backward, submissive, and timid. Cappadocians are serious and reflective, hardworking and energetic, and so on, end of quote. So these stereotypes had long-lasting reverberations 
as neighborhoods were discriminated along class and ethnicity lines. The authors of the international report must have missed the contradiction that they divided a group of people into separate essentialist categories, which they were eager to identify as one race that needed to be unmixed from other races. The League of Nations report exposed the incongruity of the entire exchange enterprise that was instituted by the League itself. There was also the question of the physical site and architectural design of the planned settlements. The uniformity of state solutions in both countries and their similarity to each other is indeed striking. For example, resource community left the extraordinary natural and built Cappadocian landscape of Sinasos and was settled in New Sinasos, where families were placed in standardized and rectangular houses on a grid iron site plan. The orderly and parallel streets were supposed to reflect rational and efficient site planning principles. This is Serafim Rizzo's own house before and after he was deported. Similarly, the town of Rizzo's photographer friends was settled in New Prokopi in state-built village houses that confirms the increasing poverty. They were not exceptions. In Greece, the RSC employed grid iron site plans and devised standardized units for both rural and urban typical houses to be repeated all across the country. These houses were characterized with their uniformity, which to some was an implementation of the modernist housing principles towards public health, hygiene, and social equality. For instance, this is Yerenia, the last RSC built housing in Athens with a standardized plan constructed with prefabricated structures. In Turkey, the Ministry of Exchange also produced typical village projects on a grid iron site plan that were regarded to be rational, affordable, efficient, and hygienic. The ministry devised standardized plans for affordable housing and slightly bigger village housing with an additional kitchen and sofa. Eventually, 69 model villages were built from scratch. There were only a few design exceptions. The garden city of the National Bank employees in Athens was designed by the architect Zumbulides, who was actually an immigrant from Sinasos and a close friend of Rizos. Advertised as a garden city in the periphery of the town, it promised fresh air, open space, and healthy housing. Another exception was near Philadelphia, built by the migrants themselves, as two-story single-family houses with verandas and balconies. The only memorial to the population exchange stands in one of its urban junctions. Both settlements' radial street system creates surprising vistas and green line paths. Only in the 1950s, the urban migrant housing was integrated into public housing. A number of settlements were constructed with multifamily building blocks that participated in public housing designs around Europe. In Turkey, architects had a uniquely direct access to these international collective housing debates because the key names of modern housing theory and practice had escaped from Nazism and were exiled in Turkey, including Tata and Wagner. Margaret Eschutelowski from the Frankfurt Public Housing Program and the designer of the Frankfurt Kitchen designed typical village school plans in Turkey during this time. Some architects produced paper projects about ideal villages and model rural houses with uh, grid iron settlement plans, but with much more emphasis on public buildings. Other architects suggested non-ordinary schemes. For instance, Dirlik turned the garden city diagram into an actual circular city. Abide Mortash suggested L-shaped houses circling large courtyards. However, it was too little too late. These projects did not move beyond the narrow circles of the profession. More importantly, architects folded the issue of model villages and affordable houses into their nationalist and often paternalistic concerns about teaching the masses how to become modern. One would look in vain for projects or essays that confront the trauma of compulsory mass population transfer. Turning a blind eye to the migrants' right to heal, the national authorities and international community behaved content with the results. Here you see two propaganda from both countries. So did the repatriation claims of the Lausanne Treaty heal the conflict and did architecture help, even if it, we assume that it partially could? Not to trivialize the immense challenge of settling millions, 
But I came to the conclusion that the authorities in both countries treated land settlement as a top-down demographic engineering device and its architecture as a technical problem in a post-disaster setting, failing to notice the trauma of mass displacement or refusing to confront the cultural complexity of their task. The standardized and typified housing units placed in equally homogenized grid iron settlement plans were meant to serve the Turkification and Hellenization policies of their respective governments. Both countries drew from the debate over standardization and industrialization that was becoming a universalizing phenomenon at the time. As a result, ironically, housing types in both countries were almost the same with each other, regardless of the climatic or historical differences. And despite the fact that their residents were separated and dislocated because of a conviction about the untranslatability of their cultures. It is very doubtful that the compulsory population transfer improved the quality of life for a majority of migrants. The Cappadocians had left extraordinary environments of fairy chimneys and resettled in standardized housing. In their testimonies, many of them complained about their new houses and increased poverty. Even though they came into much wealthier houses, Aitash's family was initially alienated with Sinasos. Many immigrants who came to Cappadocia from Greece were surprised at the flat roofs and earth surfaces. Finally, if we turn back to our present day and to this lecture's opening scene, when Oslo Özbay's team discovered a sunken communal space under the piles of debris during the retrofitting of a group of Cappadocian buildings in 2000s, they came face to face with the long history of erasures. The team was working in a village that had been deserted after being identified as a disaster zone due to the threat of falling rocks. In the meantime, the Greek-Turkish conflict had periodically reemerged, and countless buildings and settlements all over the lands after the population exchange had remained neglected. Due to the ever-expanding Turkification ideology, the life of minorities deteriorated even more. New architectural projects in ex-migrant towns were executed by denying violence and appropriating estates from former residents. Even abandoned towns, such as Levisi or Kayaköy, where the history of violence is self-evident, attracted architectural education programs and tourist developments that romanticize its ruins. To this day, most of these initiatives are aesthetically drawn to the formal and geometric qualities of the abandoned town, and its unique relation to topography. The deserted village of Kayakö has been defined as an architectural laboratory, a school to teach architectural form, a site for many programs, but hardly one that will self-critically confront its violent history. In this context, and in the context of usual global practice where architects drop into their building sites in order to fulfill their clients' demands without any acknowledgement of historical violence, in this context, Aslo Ezbay's practice stands out as an exception. After working as an architect and serving as at top posts in the Chamber of Architects in the capital city of Ankara, she decided to move and live permanently in Cappadocia in order to sustain a much closer and slower look at her context. Ezbay and Baran Idil prepared the conservation plan for Sinasos or Mustafa Pasha in 2004. A survey of slowly deteriorating housing exposed that the village was under threat, just like other abandoned towns. The architects extended the heritage site from the well-known tourist destinations of geological formations to the village itself, and thereby added the existing vernacular houses under the purview of preservation committee. Following this plan, Özbay and our protagonist Aytash, namely an architect and a migrant resident, co-organized a workshop and prepared the brochure, What We Need to Know to Preserve Mustafa Pasha, that they distributed to local habitants. The brochure emphasized the importance of local participation and outlined the preservation process step by step. Using the photographs from Rizos 1924 Sinasos album to show the village's non-ruined state, the two women thus promoted taking accountability for the population exchange by preserving and repurposing the cultural heritage of the deported populations. They identified the do's and don'ts, plausible retrofit programs, low budget and technically applicable means. 40 out of 98 mansions were restored in this way, 
of which Ezbuy was responsible for 15. Additionally, they collaborated with civil society organizations in organizing programs such as the Common Cultural Heritage that hosted two conferences and two exhibitions uh, in Mustafa Pasha and Kreta, respectively. A team of authors, NGOs, art historians, and architects from Greece and Turkey shared their historical research, went sightseeing to demolished buildings, and discussed possible action items. They issued a declaration to study, protect, and restore what they now call common cultural heritage. Unlike conventional archaeological and cultural heritage discourses that look down on locals as uneducated masses who obstruct scientific excavations and heritage protection, Özbay and Aytaş's initiative was a bottom-up conservation project that involved both professional architects and local population. Preserving and reconstructing the vernacular buildings of expelled populations is an important step in confronting the historical violence of forced migration. In the official nationalist histories of the population exchange, the focus was on the lost homeland and arriving nationals, but not on departing neighborhoods or the on departing neighbors or the lost sense of living together. Even in the most progressive reunions, under the half-hearted transitional justice measures of the 2000s, the authors defined the exchange as a painful but unavoidable scar, which could be healed only with time, as if coexistence was unthinkable. However, the 1923 exchange did not only take away their hometowns from the deported migrants, it also eliminated the possibility of a cosmopolitan existence, both for the migrants who departed and the locals who were left behind. There are ample stories in migrant testimonies all across the lands about the desire to go back to see their old houses for one last time, which was not possible due to travel bans. Some discreetly traveled back, others looked down at their village from a hill but were never able to walk down. Still others got frozen at the doorstep but carried a bag of soil or a bottle of water back. To our knowledge, Rizos could never come back to Sinasos but his old house is now turned into a hotel. Aitash also turned her house into a small hotel and appropriated part of it as a house museum, where she exhibits the belongings, photographs, and documents that her family brought from Greece, namely the things that the Lausanne Treaty had categorized as movables. Among the most common repurposing programs in the region, hotels take the first rank, but tourism is a double-edged sword. It is an important source of revenue for the region, perhaps the only economic means for Mustafa Pasha to, to fight its poverty, but it is prone to destroying the physical and social landscape. In this context, Özbay's architectural practice stands out because she participates in the tourism industry, but holds a critical distance with her uncompromised approach to retrofitting. Her conservation plan struggles for sustainable and local rather than investors' tourism. In addition to her work in Sinasos on Mustafa Pasha, the retrofitting of the Uchisar buildings on a neighboring slope provides another example. Her practice differs from the chain hotels located in modern parts of Cappadocian cities, whose owners organize daily tours to tourist destinations and thereby turn volcanic buildings into a deserted relic. Her practice also differs from the Club Met, that was the first hotel adopting the volcanic structures of the landscape. Despite the creative appropriation of the aesthetics of the environment in the interior decoration, this club met carved a large linear imposing block into the geological formations. Some new versions of the same approach are even more concerning. Instead, Özbay makes a point by constantly refraining from creating out of scale buildings. Her retrofitting process involves two stages, the reconstruction of the ruined vernacular houses on the ground and the recovery of the subterranean caves that are discovered during construction. Her team rely on a photograph taken before the town's abandonments, like the Rizos photo album. The team has renovated the existing buildings and added new designs into the decayed fabric in a piecemeal fashion in nine phases over a course of 20 years. Unlike conventional restoration projects that imitate the past mot a mot, as if history has not left aging marks or destroyed the buildings, they take a freer transformative approach in the design of surfaces and building elements.
The recovery of the subterranean caves requires months of careful removal of debris that had been piled up since the village's abandonment. In addition to the Byzantine church that they retrofitted as an event space, Özbay's team discovered a subterranean water cistern that they repurposed as wine cellar, a monk monastery as event space, and another candle oil workshop that they turned into a museum. Özbay finds architect's role to be quite foundational for the healing process. Quote, this is not an archaeological site. It is an area with rock cut cave dwellings that were still used and changed till 50 years ago. As architects who unearthed these spaces that were turned into trash dumping areas in the 20th century, we are the ones who see them first, draw them first, and research their possible functions for the first time. Our profession is responsible for preserving sensitively and understanding what we find and sharing them with historians and social scientists. The unique nature of this environment necessitated the simultaneous innovation of drawing techniques, surveying methods, and construction tools at each stage. The reconstruction process also served for the education of new tough stone masons and the revival of a craft. So to summarize, architectural responses to disasters come in two phases, while in fact it's a third, often forgotten and unfinished layer of struggle that heals. Resettlement after the trauma of compulsory mass migration took the form of temporary camps, modernist master plans and collective housing, but without sufficient attention to the intergenerational, social, cultural and international scars. After such a shock that also caused epidemics, deaths, abandonment, and slow destruction of cultural heritage, there should have been a more complex and nuanced phase of disaster response in order to identify and critically confront the cause of disaster. This lecture argued that the real cause of this crisis was not necessarily the tough transportation conditions, epidemics, state of emergency, temporary settlements, or environmental threats such as falling rocks. The real cause of the disaster was ethnocentrism and nationalism and the international treaty that strengthened the socially constructed racial identities as an international norm. In conclusion, the partitions and mass migrations between Turkey and Greece, or say India and Pakistan, might seem exceptional due to their scales, but in fact, discrimination, dispossession and migration are long-standing omnipresent and connected phenomena that reproduce each other. They need our attention also because the future is prone to their multiple effects. According to some theorists, 21st century will be the century of migrations as a result of serious global challenges of our time, such as climate change, political unrest, social and economic equality, inequality and food insecurity. However, the current international laws and global ethics fall well short to face up to this challenge. Rather than rethinking the border systems that block migrations, the world authorities are reacting to this challenge with anti-immigrant and nationalist policies. Moreover, the current world authorities are moving away rather than toward transitional justice. If I remind my introductory example, Hagia Sophia as a museum could have been made a symbol of accountability and reconciliation in the face of historical violence. It could have been an invitation to perpetual peace so that no religion erases imperially the other with military power, a unique potential that is now lost with its conversion into a mosque. That said, the need for transitional justice is not limited to the lens of ex-Ottoman empire. Instead, taking accountability for slavery in US, for colonization in Europe, as well as reparation and restrictions from West and Global North to non-West and Global South are long overdue. To that, we need to add de-imperialization and denationalization across the globe in order to come to terms with the violence created during the post-colonial nationalization process. Architecture may have a part to play in the transitional justice challenge. In this lecture, I brought your attention both to technocratic, technocratic refugee camps model villages and modern housing that turned a blind eye to violence and to a slow architectural practice that acts on land settlement, site surveys and retrofitting as platforms of accountability and reparation. Thank you.